Well, good morning. Happy Sunday. We are, uh, one of our staff members here is in the habit on Tuesday mornings when we have our staff meeting, Tuesday afternoons actually, of greeting us all with Happy Tuesday. And uh, I kind of love that. So happy Sunday to you all. We're in week three of our sermon series on Jonah. Last week, Bobby brought us a message on uh, Jonah's prayer inside the, the, the great fish. And the week before that, I shared with you guys about the journey of Jonah and his travels. So let's, uh, let's really quickly have a, a good, better recap than that. Uh, chapter one, Jonah receives a call from the Lord to preach in the city of Nineveh that their wickedness has come up before the Lord. Jonah doesn't obey God, hence the book. Goes in the opposite direction. Instead of going east to Nineveh, he goes west to Tarshish on the Atlantic coast of southern Spain. Surely the opposite of where he could have gone. He doesn't make it because a huge storm comes up, which is sent by God to turn him back. Jonah is thrown into the sea in an attempt to save the lives of the sailors he was with, but also in a last-ditch effort to avoid the calling of God on his life. But God doesn't let his story end there. God sends a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and chapter 2 shares with us the prayer of Jonah from within the belly of the fish. Jonah speaks of the goodness of the Lord, of God's mercy towards him, and God hears his prayer. The fish, well, let's say the fish delivers Jonah onto dry land. It's not pretty, but Jonah is back in his own environment, safe and sound. So let's see what happens next. I'm foregoing slides today, so I encourage you all to grab the Pew Bible in front of you, and we can read together. Jonah chapter 3 is found on page 702. That's two pages after page 700, and three pages before page 705. Seven oh two. I tried to come up with a, a joke with that number, and I just I had nothing. So this is what you get. All right, let's read Jonah chapter three. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time: Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. Yeah, I bet you did, Jonah. This time. A city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Jonah chapter 3. Let's have a word of prayer before we really dive in. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you once again for bringing us together. Thank you for the word that you've already given us from this book of Jonah. Thank you for the word that you have today and for the word that you'll have next week. Thank you that your word never runs dry and that there's always something for us to learn from you. You're a great God. We worship you. We love you. Pray that you would open it to us. Amen. I got to tell you guys, Jonah doesn't seem like much of a preacher. Can, Can you relate? I mean, in Hebrew, that whole sermon is four words. That's it. That's the whole sermon. Forty days, Nineveh overturned. In this case, the the NLT translates it destroyed. Overturned is how many other translations do it. That's it. Forty days, Nineveh overturned. I'm grateful for translators who help make sense of these words across languages. But that's it. That's the whole sermon. It's four words, and he walks in, and the city repents. 
I don't know about you, but it sounds pretty crazy to me. I mean, we got to talk about the boldness of this man. Okay, like, imagine if we got to church and, you know, everybody's all dressed up nice and we come into church and we're singing our songs. Oh, what a savior! You know, we're having a great time in front of the Lord. We all bring up our offerings and I come out. 40 more days and Winnipeg will be destroyed. Can you imagine? Like, what? Would you feel a little ripped off? I mean, I feel a little bit ripped off reading this story. I feel like we went through a whole lot to get Jonah to this point, and that's all we got. Now, in fairness to Jonah, he probably repeated this sermon every 15 seconds or so as he was walking through the city. Right? I mean, it wasn't very long. He probably repeated it over and over. I was chatting with Doug a couple of weeks ago after our first sermon, and he was telling me that it seems pretty likely that Jonah would have come out of the great fish with his skin and his hair bleached, possibly a, a bright orange, and that Jonah would have looked and smelled like the walking dead. And I th- think we'd have a different reaction if your sermon or your, your preacher came out on Sunday morning and he looked and smelled like death. And he came out in, you know, however it is you choose to describe what I'm wearing today. Whatever Jonah looked like, and however he preached the sermon, though, what matters is the amazing miracle that came out of it. You thought keeping a man alive inside a fish for three days was the main miracle of this book? How about the miracle of an entire city, 120,000 of the proudest, cruelest sinners you can imagine, turning to God in repentance and abandoning their evil ways. That's amazing. We need to remember that God is able to work through the most unusual and unexpected means. God isn't limited by our abilities or by our eloquence. In fact, we could say that God can do anything for anyone, at any time, anywhere. Anything for anyone, at any time, anywhere. Well, the second thing that I'd like to bring to your attention is the repentance, repentance of the Ninevites. Do you realize that Jonah's prophetic sermon actually did come true? I know in the NLT it says that Nineveh will be destroyed, but many of the other translations render this word overturned. And that word doesn't only mean destroyed, In the original Hebrew, it doesn't only mean destroyed. It can also mean to be turned upside down. And isn't so much of the book of Jonah upside down? I mean, it's the pagan sailors who cry out to God, and it's Jonah who runs away. It's the evil city of Nineveh that repents, and the prophet of God who gets angry when they do. The whole book feels upside down, and the city of Nineveh also gets turned upside down. The nation, the city of raiders and pillagers, repents before God in sackcloth and ashes. That was a harder word than I thought it would be. In verse 8, we read from the king's command, Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. How great is that? Can you imagine what would happen to our world if one of our great leading cities repented in this way? Can you imagine if, I don't know, New York or Los Angeles put out a you know, a call like this, or Toronto, or or Ottawa, and everyone did it? That from the greatest to the least, everyone turned to God and abandoned our violence and evil ways? Think about it. You know that budget cut that the police service is talking about here? Not a concern anymore. Homicides in our city are on track to be the highest on record? Not anymore. We've given up our evil and violent ways. One is tempted to wonder if such a thing is even possible. And unfortunately, I think this is our response far too often to God's work. Let me give you an example. There's a man that I'm thinking of. He's been known as a pop culture icon. He's made a career out of making music that has variously been called violent, misogynistic, a career out of exemplifying the most garish and narcissistic habits of our society and culture, 
a man whose choice of spouse raised some eyebrows among those of us with Christian sensibilities, and yet Kanye West has, in the last couple of years, made a very public turn to Christianity. He's revamped his musical style. He's devoted his entire most recent album to praising our Lord. He speaks in interviews about how he finishes his day by reading the Bible and of the importance that his family holds for him. Many Christians react to the reported changes in this man with skepticism and disbelief, as if we don't really believe that God can overturn a life like that. Or like maybe this is just some marketing tactic or temporary whatever. Let's see if this faith has any root. I worry that our reaction says more about us than it does about him. I worry that the world sees how we treat someone like that and suspects that we would treat them in much the same way if they were to begin their own faith journeys. I wonder if that's how the early Christians felt when they heard that a man who'd been persecuting the church, going door to door, dragging men and women into the streets, was now living and preaching that same gospel that he'd been trying to repress. I wonder what people thought when Paul's life was overturned. I wonder what they thought when Jonah came back to Israel and reported to God's people what had happened in Nineveh. How these evil, wicked people had turned to God. But God can do anything for anyone, anywhere, at any time. I'm reminded of a song. It's pretty old, but maybe for some of you it's new. And the chorus goes, What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak. What will people do when they find out it's true? At least some of you know it. If you'll allow me to wonder a little more, did people have thoughts like some of us do about Kanye West or Paul or about Nineveh? Do people wonder how sincere your turn to God was or is? Or do you stand on the other side of that question, wondering if God is really able to turn someone like you around? someone who's done so much and walked so far, to you I would say again, God can do anything for anyone at any time, anywhere. But for some of us, it's not about whether we can turn to God. It's more about whether we can turn to God again. After all this, after we went back to it again, whatever it may be in your life, after we failed, after the divorce, after the business failed, after the bankruptcy, after we didn't listen, after God spoke so clearly and gave us such obvious direction and we turned away. For those of us who are wondering that, I give you my favorite, most encouraging verse in the whole book of Jonah. It's chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. After everything Jonah had done, after Jonah had heard the voice of God and received a mission and walked away, after Jonah had been deliberately defiant, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. And if you're in that boat today where you feel like you were following God but you failed and you walked away, I've got good news for you too. God believes in second chances and in third chances and in fourth chances and in 70 times seven chances because God can do anything for anyone at any time, anywhere. And for you too. Worship team, come back up. Let's have a word of prayer to close. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would allow it to sink deep down into our hearts, that we would be good soil, that we would turn to you in our moments of failure. Lord, that we wouldn't fail less, but that when we do fail, we would still run to you, the only one who can redeem us. We thank you, Father, for your peace and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.